Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to start this morning, it's a pleasure to introduce Kenneth Wu, who will be talking about cosmology with uh, time delay, strong lensing. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Okay. Good. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, a project I've been working on uh, involving doing cosmology with time delay, strong lenses. So um, I realize this is a cosmology-focused conference, but uh, you might not necessarily be familiar with the basics of strong lensing as opposed to weak lensing, so I'll go through that a little bit. But first, uh, just some very basic background. I'm sure you know people here are very familiar with the standard model of cosmology, where you have just a basic six-parameter model um, called flat lambda CDM, where you basically have no curvature and um, equation state parameter equal to minus one. And um, so these pictures you saw yesterday uh, from a nice lecture we had from Lyman Page. Uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about those uh, in the coming days. But um, essentially, if you missed that, uh, the Planck satellite shown here has measured the cosmological parameters of the universe to very high precision. But the problem with that is Planck's results are highly model dependent. So if you assume that this flat lambda CDM model holds, then you get these very tight constraints in all these parameters. But once you start relaxing some of these assumptions, so for example, if you um, do some extensions to flat lambda CDM, such as allowing for curvature or allowing for um, an equation of state parameter W equal to something other than minus one, um, or you do things like changing the relativistic neutrino species, things like that, then you can start to get some degeneracies in your constraints. So here are just a couple plots from the Planck collaboration that kind of highlight this. So these plots show different parameters. So here is um, curvature against uh, omega, that's, that's omega matter. And um, this is W versus a time varying component of W. So if you relax some of those assumptions of flat lambda CDM, you get sort of these big banana shaped um, ellipse contours. And you notice that the points here are color-coded, and the different colors on that plot represent different values of the Hubble constant, h naught. So it turns out that there are a lot of degeneracies with h naught because the CMB alone does not constrain it. You have to either assume the flat lambda CDM model or get some independent constraint on h naught. So it turns out that having an independent probe of the Hubble constant is one of the strongest um, complementary constraints you can add to the Planck measurements um, in order to nail down these cosmological parameters. So the, um, having an independent h naught measurement is crucial for overcoming systematics, um, and especially what we refer to as the unknown unknowns, things that you know, we don't know could be going wrong um, in either the Planck mission or um, with our cosmological model. So, the best known way of constraining the Hubble constant independently is through observations of type 1a supernovae that are um, calibrated via the distance ladder method. So this is um, using a series of intermediate distance indicators to calibrate the absolute distance to type 1a supernovae, and then using those supernovae to determine the distance redshift relation um, out to higher redshifts. So um, this has been work led by Adam Reese, among others. And what his collaboration, which is called the Schutz collaboration, has been finding is they're finding a Hubble constant, which is a little bit higher than the results you get for Planck if you assume the flat lambda CDM model. So here's a plot showing that. Here is, um, right here is the Planck measurement. This is uh, the Planck 16 measurement, but the recent Planck 18 measurement is about the same. And um, this is the result from Adam Reese's group, the Shoes collaboration. And you see they're, they're finding something about 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec, whereas Planck flat lambda CDM is about 67 or so. So it's, there's a little bit of tension here. It's about a three point something sigma tension. So, so what is the cause for this? Well, at the moment, this is unresolved. Um, both collaborations think they're doing everything correctly. And um, they're continually making new measurements, coming up with new methods. It just seems like these two values are not really moving very much. They're kind of staying at 67, 73 in that ballpark. So um, 
is there some problem with one or both experiments, or is there actually something wrong with our cosmological model? Um, so that's potentially exciting. So in order to understand this better, we would like to get more precise and more accurate measurements of H0, and especially independent measurements, um, independent of both Planck and um, the Type 1a supernovae, so that you know, we can t test some of the systematics that might be involved in one or both methods. So one way to do that is through strong gravitational lensing. Um, so with strong gravitational lensing, you have a chance alignment of some massive object, such as a galaxy or a galaxy cluster, and some bright background source, such as a quasar or a galaxy. So here's, um, here are some simple diagrams showing uh, strong lensing. So here is uh, the observer. We're sort of looking out in this direction. Here is some massive object, say a galaxy. And here is some bright background source. So this source is going to emit light rays in all directions. Some of them will pass by this very massive lens and will get deflected towards the observer. So when we look out in that direction, we can see highly distorted and magnified images. And if the alignment is good enough, we can see multiple images of that background source. So here's a short animation um, also showing this principle. So um, since we know that all of the images we see all, all of the multiple images we see have to arise from the same location in the source plane, um, we can fit a lens model to this intervening mass distribution. So the idea is to ask, what is the mass distribution of this lens that will map all of those images back onto the same location in that background source plane? Um, and in doing this and fitting for that lens model, we can learn a lot of things. So um, strong lensing has been used for a variety of uh, scientific purposes. So we can understand things like the total mass of the lens and even the shape of the lens um, mass profile. So it's slope or ellipticity and orientation. Um, and that's important because lensing is sensitive to all of the matter, including dark matter. So this is one of the ways to probe the dark matter distribution in galaxies and clusters. Uh, we can also learn a lot about the background source due to lensing magnification. So typically that background source will be magnified by a factor of a few. Um, and in cluster, scenario, cluster lensing scenarios, it can be magnified by even more, like several tens or up to a hundred. So you can resolve features in that background source by taking advantage of the cosmic telescope effect of strong lenses. So I'm not going to talk about any of that today. I'm going to focus on a completely different science case, which is using strong lensing to do cosmology. So the way that we can do that is through uh, strong lensing time delays. So if your background source is variable, um, what happens is there's a time delay between the different images that you see. So, because, so any um, packet of light rays that are emitted from the source at the same instant will arrive at the observer at different times because the light rays will traverse slightly different path lengths and will go through slightly different lens potentials um, to each of the four images. So, um, so for example, if you have a four image lens like this, you see you know, four images. This is a lens supernova, by the way, the first lens supernova that um, we've been able to resolve. It's called Refstal. Um, so you have these four Im images of the supernova. So even though the supernova went off at one time, the light rays that went to each of these four images arrived at the observer at different times because of this difference in potential and path length. So we see the supernova go off in one image, then another image, then another image, and then another image. And you can measure the delay time between those images. And it turns out that the time delay, um, you can construct a, um, you can construct a distance called the time delay distance, which we represent by this value d delta t. Um, it turns out that the time delay uh, that you measure is proportional to the time delay distance, um, which is just a ratio of angular diameter distances between the, the observer, the lens, and the source, um, times this lens potential term. So this is the term you get out of your mass model, so fitting a lens model um, to, this, to your observations. And this is important because the factors of H0 that go into time delay distance here cancel out in a way so that the time delay distance is inversely proportional to H0. So the idea here is if you could measure the time delay and you get an accurate model of your lens potential, then you could determine the time delay distance and therefore determine the Hubble constant. So this is, um, this is a completely independent method of determining the Hubble constant, uh, completely independent of the supernova method 
and completely independent of the CMB. And it's a one-step method, so instead of having to rely on intermediate um, distance calibrators, uh, it's like a, think of it like a distance ladder with just one rung on it. So um, you might think that lens supernovae are good sources for this because um, there's obviously a very clear change in when the supernova before it goes off and after it goes off, so you can measure very accurately this time delay. Um, unfortunately, lens supernova at the moment are extremely rare. We've only observed um, two of them ever that have, we've been able to resolve and you know, catch the different images going off. So um, maybe in the future this will become um, a more uh, a more viable method, but for now we sort of rely on lens quasars. So lens quasars are variable on short time scales of order days, and they're bright and easy to detect. So the idea is you observe a lens quasar and you just monitor it for a, a very long period of time. So every few nights just take an image of the lens quasar and measure the flux of each of the images. So um, here are some observations of a lens quasar. So you see uh, four images, so one, two, three, four. There's a very faint one there. And every few nights, just take an image, measure the brightness, and then over time, you build up these light curves of the different images. And once you have enough um, points on this light curve, you can look for features that correspond to the same event happening in the source plane. So if the quasar changes in brightness suddenly, you might see a, a sharp spike or, you know, um, it'll suddenly go up or suddenly go down. And these are going to be shifted in time because of the time delay. So you just look for these features and then shift the light curves until they match up and then you have your time delay. So, so again, to measure this time delay distance and infer the Hubble constant, you need to measure the time delay. Um, through this monitoring. You need an accurate lens model, which I'll talk about later. Um, you also need to estimate the mass along the line of sight because since lensing is sensitive to the entire mass distribution along the line of sight, um, you have to account for these perturbations by um, the lens environment or just random line of sight structure. Um, I'll point out, in addition to this time delay distance, there is a way to combine the time delay measurement with a measurement of the lens galaxy velocity dispersion to determine the angular diameter distance to the lens. This is sort of just an independent constraint that gives you a little bit more information. Um, <clears throat> I'll refer you to these papers by NG, uh, who has pioneered a lot of work on this. So, um, so I've been working as part of a collaboration called h Not Lenses in Cosmo Grail's Wellspring, or we go by our acronym Holy Cow. And our, our goal is to do a detailed analysis of several time delay lenses um, using long-term monitoring from the Cosmo Grail collaboration. So this is a collaboration being led by, by Fred Corban in Switzerland. And um, he's been monitoring some of these lens quasars for over a decade now. So this is a very long-term project um, with a lot of data. Uh, we have high-resolution imaging either from HST or ground-based AO data to do the lens modeling. So that gets us our accurate lens potential. And we've been able to get a lot of wide field imaging and spectroscopy um, in the fields of these lenses to characterize the mass along the line of sight and account for their perturbations. So we have completed four lenses at the moment. So uh, all the lenses in this top row, and um, this is our latest one down here. It was just published um, a couple of months ago. And uh, so these four are completed, and these two right here are going to be completed within the next um, couple of months, hopefully. So. Uh, we will have six lenses shortly, um, and we also have more in the pipeline as well. We have the data, we just have to do the analysis. So I'll just step through the various pieces of the analysis um, and how we do them. So first with the time delay measurements, um, as I said, we were working with the Cosmo Grail collaboration, um, who've been doing the, this long-term monitoring using a variety of small telescopes around the world. Um, they, they've developed a lot of well-tested algorithms to do the time delay measurements. So here's a sample light curve. Um, that's, this is the light curve of this lens here. So you have, you have four images, but these two are blended in ground-based data, so we treat that. So you have um, image A, B, and C, and here are the light curves for each of those images. And they've sort of been shifted in magnitude, so you can see the, um, you can distinguish them. So, you're, so now we just have to shift these light curves until the features line up on top of each other, and that's how we measure the time delay. 
Um, you'll notice that this started in 2004, so this is about a 14-year long light curve now. Each point here is one night's measurement, so we get a measurement every you know, three or four nights or so, and we built up these, um, these very nice-looking light curves. We need those long baselines to overcome uh, microlensing, so microlensing due to stars in the lens galaxy can actually mimic um, features, intrinsic features, due to um, quasar variability. So we have to uh, monitor for several seasons in order to overcome that. But recently, we've been doing high cadence monitoring using um, this telescope, the MPIA 2.2 meter. Um, so this is just one season now of observations, but now instead of every three or four nights, we get an image every single night. And here we're looking for much smaller variations than we were before. Uh, this was just done as a test to see whether we could actually do this. And um, because the timescale here is much shorter than the microlensing variability timescale, you don't have to worry about microlensing. Um, and this tends to, this actually works out well. We've gotten um, this lens and we're working on a few others. So moving forward, we think we can maybe get in just one or two seasons um, an accurate time delay for some lenses. So this is very promising. Um, we also have to account for mass along the line of sight. So um, since we know lenses tend to be biased towards massive galaxies and those tend to lie in overdense environments, we have to um, characterize galaxies and groups both in the local lens environment and along the line of sight. So we do that through a combination of imaging and spectroscopy. So with the spectroscopy, we look for um, <clears throat> groups and clusters along the line of sight. And we also get the redshifts of nearby perturbers. So if you have a galaxy very close to the lens, this might have a large effect. You might need to include it in your mass model. So we need the redshift to do that. Um, and we have stellar mass estimates from our photometry as well. Um, the way that we estimate the perturbations by using, um, using the imaging and spectroscopy is uh, essentially through a weighted number counts method. So if we just count up all of the galaxies that are nearby the lens within some aperture, and then we go to um, a survey that uses the same observational parameters, and then look at random lines of sight uh, with that same aperture, we ask how over dense is the lens line of sight relative to random. And then we can go into a cosmological simulation, such as the Millennium Simulation, and then we can pick out lines of sight in the simulation that have the same relative overdensity. So, you know, if the lens line of sight has like 1.2 times the number of galaxies as random, we pick out um, lines of sight in the simulation that also are 1.2 times overdense in number counts. And the simulation, since you know where all the mass is, then you can just calculate directly what is the effect on, um, on your time delay distance and then uh, apply that after um, in post-processing. And completely independent of that, we've also done some weak lensing analyses of the fields containing these lenses. And um, we've only done it for one lens so far, but um, in, that, in that one field, the result we got was very consistent with our weighted number counts method. So, um, so that's uh, reassuring. And then finally, we, uh, we have to do the lens modeling. So um, in the past, there have been some issues with uh, degeneracies in lens modeling, because since quasars are very bright, you, you have to use just the four quasar images as your constraints. But if we have deep HST or ground-based AO imaging, what we can do is we can actually um, characterize the PSF very accurately and then subtract off the um, the quasar light, so that you can see, you might be able to see underneath, um, this is the data in the top row, you might be able to see like this faint ring underneath those quasar images. That's actually the host galaxy of the quasar that's being lensed into this ring. And if you subtract off the quasar light, you can use the, the surface brightness distribution of the host galaxy as additional constraints. So essentially every pixel in this ring here is an additional constraint on your lens model. So um, this is just a sample of one of the lenses in our, that we've completed. So this is the data. This second row is um, the best fit model reconstruction. And then this is the residual here. So, um, <clears throat> so this allows us to break a lot of degeneracies in the lens modeling that in the past people were not necessarily able to do when they just were using the quasar images. So um, this gets us a very accurate lens model and a lens potential. And throughout this entire process, um, we perform our analysis blindly. So what that means is when we're looking at results, so whenever we make plots of, say, the time delay distance or h naught, um, we never actually look at the absolute value. We subtract off the median of the distribution. 
And the reason for this is um, just to prevent confirmation bias. So if you expect your H naught value to be a certain number like 73 or 67, um, it might convince you that you're, you're doing well when you get a value close to what you expect. But by blinding it and never actually looking at the value, you can still analyze covariances between your cosmological parameters and other lens model parameters. But it forces you to be very confident in your systematics checks. Um, and we don't unblind until everyone in the collaboration is satisfied with the analysis and has signed off on it. So um, this is just uh, an additional um, safety valve to prevent this confirmation bias. OK, so uh, I'll just, in the last few slides, I'll just talk about our results now. So from the first four lenses of our analysis, um, <clears throat> we have been able to, for a flat lambda CDM cosmology, we've been able to constrain H0 to about 3% precision. And our measurement from these first four lenses is H0 of 72.5, plus or minus roughly 2.2 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, again, this assumes flat lambda CDM cosmology, but because we actually constrain the time delay distance um, and not H0, you can apply that to any general cosmological model. So if you, um, if you look at some of our recent papers, uh, you can see some results for additional cosmologies, but I'm just focusing on the flat lambda CDM case here. So if you compare that to the, the type 1a supernova result and the Planck result um, that's shown in this plot here, so here is Planck CMB. Um, this is the shoes result from Adam Rees using the distance ladder and supernova. And here is our current result at the moment. So it seems like we are agreeing more with the supernova result than we are with the Planck CMB result. Um, we still don't know what is the source of this tension, but we have provided just an independent, um, completely independent measurement of H0. Uh, and now, if you combine these two, we get this purple point here. So we're calling this the local universe measurement as opposed to the CMB measurement here. Um, that combination is now something like a four sigma tension, roughly. So um, again, very interesting. We still don't know what's causing this. Uh, it's been causing a lot of controversy in the cosmological community over the past couple of years. Uh, but we're continuing to work on um, refining our result, getting more systems, improving our techniques to get, hopefully, um, get these error bars down a bit. So moving into the future, um, I mentioned we have these two lenses that are coming up. They're going to be analyzed within the next couple of months. And um, that result, we think, will come out soon. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that 3% down to maybe not quite 2%, but hopefully close to that. Um, and we have more in the pipeline uh, as we improve our sample. Um, we're also continuing to improve and refine our analysis methods. So we're using a variety of lens modeling codes. Um, I mentioned the high cadence monitoring for the time delays. Uh, so in just one season, we can measure a time delay potentially. Um, we, we're also learning about potential new systematics. So there's this um, issue called the microlensing time delay. I'm not going to get into uh, the details of that, but um, Chris Kachanik and his student came up with this uh, potential source of systematic last year. And um, you know we've been working among ourselves and also trying to talk with them about ways to mitigate that. And I think we've been able to come up with some ways to, uh, to deal with this. Um, and we're also starting to do ground-based AO modeling. So before we were using mostly HST, but now we're, so, uh, now we're going into AO as well because we think we can get comparable constraints and potentially, um, hopefully, better constraints if we can get higher resolution because HST is not going to be around forever. Um, the number of known lens quasars is still pretty small. So we have of order, you know, tens or so of them. And most of them don't have the necessary measurements, so we don't have the time delays or the, the high resolution imaging. But with these new surveys like DES or HSC, we're, um, we're always discovering more. And of course, once LSST and Euclid go online, we expect to find potentially thousands of these lens quasars. So, um, so there is definitely the potential to get to the sub-percent level here with this upcoming sample. So um, I think with that, I will end and just show uh, some credits here. Uh, if you're interested, please check out our website and also look at our, um, our papers online. Thank you.
uh, if you have to think of uh, ways to increase the error bars, like I mean, one of the things when you showed in the when you looked at Planck results and looked at the sigma eight or the H zero, you showed that okay, if we have other parameters, it will move H zero to higher values. But oh, over I here, see. if you look at really systematics over here, if I have to come up of think of what can go in that will increase the error bars. I mean, one thing is that if we increase the error bars, it may become consistent. Do do you have Clues to that, like what are the things that we should think of? You mean our, our error bars here? Yeah. Um, so we we think we've we've tried a, a lot of different um, things, like you know, different model assumptions, different modeling methods, um, different in some cases different data sets. We think we're accounting for as much systematic uncertainties as we can think of and reasonably put into the analysis. Um, but as I mentioned, there are these unknown unknowns. Um, we are learning more with each lens. We are learning, hey, we need to include this, or whatever. We, at some point, we are planning to go back and, and reanalyze the whole sample using the latest techniques we've developed. Because you know, like the first lens we analyzed, um, a lot of the techniques were different from what we're using now, just because we've learned a lot. Um, I don't know if that will increase the error bars significantly or not. Um, it, it's possible, but um, I don't know that there's anything that would make it much, you know, much larger. Sorry, the discussion um, of the H not the sort of traditional H not measurements and the possible systematics that. Michael Rigaud has shown in the low redshift calibration, which would basically shift the shoe, if, if correct, would shift the shoe's result down to a value of about 70. Um, I've, I'm not super familiar with it. I've heard uh, some of these potential like reanalyses of the, the distance ladder calibration using, like, yeah, I think, different assumptions of different data sets. Um, is that what you're talking about? Oh, okay. A couple of different populations of type 1A supernovae, uh, and they tend to inhabit different um, stellar, uh, different environments. Mm, okay. And uh, the mix of environments in the calibration low redshift sample is different than the mix of environments in the high redshift sample from which the h not measurement, when okay. you combine them, I'm, comes. I'm not very familiar with that. Sorry. Interesting development. Um, now that I see, I mean, the last time I saw uh, Sherry give a talk like this, it looked, it seemed like your results were down around 70, um, and so I thought this would all sort of come together, but. I don't think they were ever around seven. I think, um, so in our previous analysis where we only had three lenses, it was, I think it was 71.9. Um, I think that's the lowest it's been. Yeah, so I see that you, so you have to, in the flat lambda CDM model, you fit for H0 and omega matter simultaneously, yes? So um, uh, if uh, flat lambda CDM, so we have, we have sort of two models. One is um, fixing omega matter, and one is allowing to vary with some flat prior. But this is the one allowing to vary with some flat so prior. What is the value of omega matter you got here? So omega matter is actually very poorly constrained. Um, I can show you a plot later, but it's, if you make a, a contour plot of H0 versus omega matter, it's this huge banana that's almost vertical. Um, it's very slightly tilted. That's why you get a very slight constraint on it. But it, it's, um, yeah, there's almost no constraint. 